And this is uh, my first time in Singapore, but on the way here on the plane, I watched the movie uh, Crazy Rich Asians, and by the time I arrived here, I felt like I've already been to Singapore. I could recognize some of the landmarks on the ride uh, from airports to, to the hotel. Plus, the movie also sets very high-end uh, standards, which uh, I definitely fulfilled at this meeting, so I'm very pleased by uh, how everything is run. So thank you very much for inviting me here. And um, I certainly hope that uh, in the far future, probably not in the near future, but in some future, uh, different groups that are exploring same things will be talking, collaborating together. So it's uh, a pleasure to see such a diverse uh, audience um, in, in one place. And again, hopefully it will bring some fruits uh, sometime soon. Um, so uh, today I'll try to tell you about topology of the space of quantum field theories. And uh, this is something I wanted to understand pretty much uh, most of all my career. That was very confusing when people use terms like theory space. So today I'll be asking, what is uh, this theory space? So if you have space of quantum field theories, it's some kind of entity such that every point in the space is represented by a quantum field theory. And uh, does it even make sense to talk about such space? Uh, what's the metric on the space? And uh, as you can probably guess from the title of the talk, what's the topology on the space? Well, we know by now that some quantum field theories are Lagrangian. We can construct them and study their perturbations, uh, namely smaller G flows um, around them by means of Feynman diagrams. So for perturbative quantum field theories, we can say uh, what goes in here and what goes out of here for any given point. <clears throat> and uh, this works particularly well, and that's usually where we start our expansion in Feynman diagrams, when field theory in question is conformal. So uh, conformal field theories, or CFTs, are fixed points of such uh, flows in and out. But as we also know very well, Feynman diagrams allow us to go only epsilon away from a given theory. So we don't have in general tools to predict what happens if we take this RG flow uh, far up or far down. In addition, recently we learned that there are non-Lagrangian theories. So in this big landscape or whatever this is, uh, space of theories, there are theories which cannot be described by uh, conventional Feynman diagrams, so we cannot easily compute uh, where they flow by or G flow up or down, but we do know that uh, they also exhibit uh, RG flows, and sometimes they can be connected to Lagrangian theories by RG flows. Yeah? Probably not. It's, I don't think it's the manifold. I don't think the question is what kind of space it is. So that's, that's the kind of question I want to ask in this talk. Um, again, when people talk about theory space, I never understand what it is. So consider this talk as a uh, very uh, simple attempt, simple-minded attempt to tackle this sort of question. Wilson would say a quantum theory is an yes, yes, yeah. So I guess um, yeah. you have this foliation and you like I, I, I leave it up to you. I leave it up to taste to consider different versions. The answers that I'll present today will be mostly about this space where each point is a quantum field theory. But there will be certain questions. For example, once we start, start talking about topology, uh, indeed, the sleeves will play a crucial role rather than individual points. This just makes it easier for me to think uh, about the problem. So the question is, what can we say about such space? Is it useful or not? Uh, shall I completely, for the rest of my life, abolish the notion of theory space, or shall I take it more seriously? And if so, can it, can it actually teach us something about physics? I don't want to develop a notion which is useless in this talk or in general, by, by thinking about it, I really want to make predictions. Verifiable predictions uh, in a sense that by knowing certain facts that we already know, we can uh, say, either rule out or, or say that there should exist certain conformal field theories, for example. That would be a concrete prediction, and uh, today I'll aim for lots of such things. 
So in fact, I'll, throughout the talk, I'll make various predictions that I don't know if they're true or fall, false, but they're verifiable and they're concrete. So that's, that's, that's the goal. So in other words, I want to develop this or understand structure of this space, not for the sake of mathematical structure. I don't really care much about that part. Uh, I want to use this structure to teach us something uh, specific about physics. So first simple questions as we start uh, approaching this, um, uh, thinking in this mode, uh, will be about uh, simple topological structures on, on this big space. And simple topological structures are either homology or cohomology. So indeed, um, this can naturally appear in um, this setting. And uh, first, I'll try to tell you why, and then we'll try to proceed to more esoteric or more sophisticated invariants. So the space I just described, um, this space of quantum field theories, is what throughout the talk I'll call uh, this uh, curly T. So this will be a big space that we're trying to explore. Uh, the usual capital T will refer to particular theories. So for example, here we have various uh, theories such as T1, T2, and so on and so forth. And um, our G flow um, connects uh, different fixed points, uh, as we just discussed. So you can think of our G time as, as a sort of time variable, and then the flow between these different fixed points um, will be sort of trajectory in, uh, in this um, describing, if you wish, emotion of a particle on this big uh, space, capital or curly T, with respect to, to time variable, which is RG time. Of course, it also uh, may be a good idea to fix dimension um, in which we study this quantum field theories. So capital D will refer to dimension of such QFTs, so we'll study QFTs in various dimensions D. Again, it's just uh, an assumption for now, uh, because there are, of course, our G flows across dimensions. We know many examples. But it's probably easier to start somewhere, so we'll fix dimension. It may be also uh, useful to fix amount of symmetry or supersymmetry. So in that case, I'll talk about space of theories with such and such properties. It still probably is a huge infinite dimensional space, and the goal is to understand uh, this, this space. So first, uh, simple insight comes from a uh, way of thinking about um, this problem as a dynamical system. Dynamical system in general, there are two types of dynamical systems, con uh, continuous and discrete. And continuous dynamical systems, which are more relevant to these questions, are simply defined as a space, and we already have a space, this is curly T, and a vector field at every point. So if you think about it, this uh, picture of uh, points in a theory space with vectors given by beta functions are nothing by, but dynamical systems. So therefore, uh, the usual setup of quantum field theory in uh, whatever interpretation of this theory space is nothing but dynamical system. Now the question is, can you actually learn something from this? Can you learn something useful? Well, the first... Uh, Simple observation is that, um, and again, it's, it's, it's very natural, especially if you want to learn about topology of the space, is to try to focus your attention on the fixed points. Because, like I said in the very beginning, these are the ones which we actually know best. So when we do Feynman diagram expansion, we do usually Feynman diagram expansion around the free theory or conformal field theory. So. <clears throat> this conformal field theories or fixed points of these uh, flow lines is what we understand better than regions somewhere in between. And then the natural question is, can we infer something about this theory space from the data of fixed points? Or conversely, if we know something about topology or structure of the space, can we predict something about existence of the fixed point? This sort of questions the question sounds very much like familiar question in the Morse theory, where you can think of a Morse index is the number of uh, directions in this big uh, space T, such that uh, along these directions the flow is out. So in this um, illustration here, 
for example, in this two-dimensional plot, which is very similar to the one I have on the blackboard, this fixed point has two directions, uh, which are described by relevant operators so that we can flow down. This one has all the flows coming into it, so it's the end point of all kinds of RG flows from either here or here or anywhere else. And therefore, you can endow such uh, fixed points of the flow with uh, information, which you can think of as an analog of the Morse index, that tells you uh, how many ways are there to go out of this particular uh, fixed points via relevant deformations. The number of relevant deformations for each uh, conformal field theory may be uh, infinite, but number of relevant deformations is usually finite. And this way of thinking about our G flows as dynamical systems suggests that it's a useful quantity. Now, given the structure, sorry, um, information about the fixed points encoded in, in this uh, kind of index mu, analog of the Morse index, would quickly tell us that um, the complex built out of these fixed points, the differentials given by flow lines and so on, should simply give the cohomology of this space T. That would be true in the settings of the usual Morse theory, where everything is nice and uh, non-degenerate. So, for example, critical points would have to be so-called Morse critical points. The total space T would have to be compact. But, of course, this is never true in the uh, reasonable applications to um, such RG flows, where even on this graph you see that there are many non-compact directions, so this picture is non-compact. But this doesn't scare people in dynamical systems. In fact, uh, Charles Conley developed, uh, if you wish, a version of Morse theory, which applies precisely to these situations. And it works very much like Morse theory, except that it works very well in the non-compact setting and allows you to determine fixed points um, from the topology of even non-compact space T on which the dynamical system lives, and vice versa, if you know information about the fixed points, you can infer uh, structure of topology, the precise term is, it's, it's called Conley index, of the entire uh, space on which it happens. So this Conley index is basically a cohomology or homology of the entire space in a setting where you don't have to have smoothness or compactness. So that's why various branches of mathematics, such as gauge theory, when you apply this to moduli spaces and so on, quickly replace cohomology by, by this uh, so-called Conley index. So that's a rather simple-minded uh, um, idea, but it also has interesting um, uh, implications, in particular, uh, using this idea, even applying it to existence or well-studied uh, systems and RG flows, you can either predict or rule out existence of certain fixed points. And uh, in a couple of papers that I wrote a few years ago, I apply this to various ON models and uh, QED in three dimensions with various uh, matter, where sometimes you find surprising conclusions just based on this. So that already uh, leads to something concrete and verifiable. So next question is, what about homotopy uh, types of, or homotopy groups of this big T? So here I discussed that cohomology, or to be more precise, this Conley index is encoded in the structure of the fixed points. So what about um, homotopy groups, which are a little bit more subtle? and uh, as perhaps not too surprising, capture a little bit more information. So for the rest of this talk, I'll mainly focus attention uh, to theories uh, in the simplest possible dimension. So here I said that we can study this in any dimension D. So for me, D will be one plus one, or equivalently, we'll talk about two-dimensional theories. And I'll assume the minimal possible supersymmetry, which is really not much of a of supersymmetry for practical purposes. So this is going to be one real supercharge, uh, so-called N01 supersymmetry. And there are basically uh, two types of systems in across all dimensions, which may have this number of supersymmetries. It's either this two-dimensional theory, uh, chiral with right moving n equals one supersymmetry, or it's dimensional reduction to zero plus one dimensions, which is so-called n equals one quantum mechanics, and we'll encounter both of them in this talk today. So 
Uh, as I say, we want to fix basic characteristics of QFTs, such as dimension, supersymmetry, and then ask, okay, what is this space? Does topology of the space tell us something interesting? Later on, I may choose also uh, to fix flavor symmetries or global symmetries of such theories, but for now, we'll just limit ourselves to uh, two-dimensional zero, zero, 0,1 uh, quantum field theories. Now, there is a conjecture due to uh, Stefan Stoltz and Peter Teichner um, related to structure of such uh, theory space of 2D01 theories, which says that it has <coughs> many connected components and uh, topology of the space is rather intricate. In particular, uh, the way we interpret their conjecture, which is phrased differently, so there could be two Full, uh, potential problems with, with this statement. First of all, it can be false, just as a conjecture, and secondly, our interpretation of their statement may be false. So take it with a grain of salt. But our interpretation is that families of two-dimensional zero-one theories, which are parameterized by some space X, modular zero-one deformations, or in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, something which is well-defined, uh, namely generalized cohomology, of this space X. Um, in other words, uh, it gives a physical interpretation of this generalized cohomology theory invented by Hopkins and Miller called TMF. So TMF stands for topological modular forms. And um, claim is that for um, TMF of some space X, uh, which parameterizes uh, zero one theories, um, is nothing but um, uh, the space of homotopy classes of maps from uh, this parameter space into this uh, big space of zero one theories. Basically, we're studying how various um, if you have uh, various subspaces parameterizing these theories, how they can be embedded into, into this big theory space. Yes? It, uh, exactly, so TMF, is, it's, it's both. It's, uh, so here it's used as cohomology theory, but TMF is indeed a spectrum, and I'll come back to this on the next slide. So, Indeed, this is generalized cohomology theory constructed out of TMF spectrum. And these are what's used here, and this is probably the only slide in this talk, maybe there will be one more, where it's used as cohomology, generalized cohomology of X. So that's what it is. Yes, yes, yes. Again, I have no idea if this is true or not. Uh, so this is motivation for us. My personal dream was for many years to give a physical interpretation to theory of topological modular forms. So with this motivation in mind, I'll try to give you proposed physical interpretation of TMF, and there are quite a few goals that we need to tackle along this way. So um, I'll, I'll show you how, how that goes. In particular, this physical interpretation will imply the following, that if you're given any um, um, two-dimensional zero-one theory, then it will define for you a class in um, what's called uh, pi d, this uh, d homotopy group of TMF. So here I use it as a, as a spectrum, really. And um, <coughs> this statement uh, actually can be derived from, from the previous slide uh, because TMF, uh, this generalized cohomology theory, indeed, as Eric pointed out, comes from a very intricate structure, which in mathematics goes by the name of spectra and so on. This actually implies that for this to be true, you have to have a series of operations on 2D01 theories, such as plus, minus, and multiplication, and they are not as obvious. They are not just taking tensor product of theories, they are slightly more complicated. And again, if, if they are true, then you can actually um, relate 
Um, even in the basic case where you consider this space X to be just a point, you can relate uh, cohomology, uh, the generalized cohomology of a point to uh, homotopy groups of the spectrum. So uh, that's uh, this right-hand side. And by the previous slide, it has to be a set of connected components. This will be some abelian group, which describes connected components of this theory space, uh, which actually is graded by gravitational anomaly. So this is probably not too surprising. So here in this formula, the number D uh, that I'm writing has to be the gravitational anomaly of a two-dimensional theory, namely uh, twice right-moving central charge minus left-moving central charge. Two-dimensional theories with zero-one supersymmetry, of course, don't have to have equal left-right moving central charges. And this becomes the grading, the degree of uh, this TMF. So <coughs> this is conjecture. And uh, again, our job is to test it and find uh, its, its physics home. But I want to point out that it's highly non-trivial. So first of all, for it to be true, it has to be that for all two-dimensional zero-one theories, which are absolute in the sense that they can be defined on their own, not as a boundary of some three-dimensional theory, uh, central charges have to be half integer in order for this to even make sense. I don't know a proof of this statement. In fact, if you think about just the difference has to be. Yes, yes, that's right. So. Well, if the, yes, that's that's right. So uh, C left minus C right it has to be an integer. And again, I don't know a proof of the statement. So it's probably provable, but I want to point out that this is something uh, that we currently don't have in the literature. So secondly, this is something extremely concrete. For each value of D, for each value of difference of C right minus C left, this is a very concrete space. And therefore, it means that every 2D01 theory that you can construct has to represent a class in here. And for this conjecture to be true, first of all, you want to check that all classes are represented. All theories in the same class are related by these deformations the way we described. And secondly, um, theories which cannot be connected by deformations in the physical world actually belong to different classes. And all of that has to match with something very concrete that we have on the right-hand side. So therefore, we need to answer several physical questions. We need to classify the landscape of 2D01 theories well enough that we can differentiate things which are in the same class, namely equivalent, in different classes, namely can, cannot be connected. Therefore, there should be very subtle anomalies in two dimensions which don't allow connecting our certain theories. And uh, everything that's here has to be represented and vice versa. There shouldn't be anything that's not in there. It's a ring structure. It's actually, it's, it's a ring. And uh, yes, it has a meaning. In fact, it's uh, related to these three operations I briefly mentioned that it means that there are several operations on 2D01 theories, which in the paper we'll call plus, minus, and multiplication. I won't talk much about this today, but you can find it there. So indeed, it's, it's a very delicate uh, structure, which implies quite a lot about what should be true in physics. And again, I, I don't know if that is actually true. In the very end, I'll make comments about high-dimensional theories and some analogous structure. But from the viewpoint of studying this uh, homotopy types of space of theories, it's rather specific to two dimensions. Oh, and, and, and uh, zero one. There should be a story for zero two. Um, we've thought a little bit about it, but I don't know the answer. Well, if you restrict, uh, it's, it's a question of, on the one hand, you might imagine that by imposing further restrictions, you limit your uh, richness of, of this structure. But by imposing further restrictions, you also limit denominator, namely deformations by which you mod out. So therefore, two things can happen. And it's not obvious to me how a zero two space of theories, its topology compares to questions we're discussing here. <laughs> well. <laughs> Um, 
Conjecture comes from, I'll, actually I'll point to you later in the talk. It's, it's, it's very contrived and again, uh, reinterpreting in the physics for, uh, words uh, to, took an effort. In fact, uh, people had this question for a long time, how to interpret physically what, what's going on there and justify or rule out this conjecture. And I'll, tell, I'll make some comments, perhaps addressing your question along the way. If I don't, ask me in the end. Uh, that, that's right. So uh, I'll approach it as a physicist. So I'll be talking about field theories, uh, thinking about them uh, mostly as uh, theories that can be defined on both Euclidean and Lorentzian signature. There are certain questions where Euclidean structure is important, but um, it won't play any role in this talk. So in fact, that, that's one of the things where uh, I would like to deviate from my original motivation a little bit. I want to really find a physics form for this. Yes. Yes. So that means that uh, all of the theories uh, will have to be in one class, namely trivial class, and they all have to be connected for this to be true. So that's, uh, these are kind of things that, that one wants to check. That's, that's a very strong statement about uh, physics of such zero one theories. So we have a lot of work to do. We have to uh, um, understand uh, physics, and of course, uh, once we understand it well enough, so we, uh, perhaps not in the talk, but in the paper we propose this physical interpretation of TMF, it actually leads to new predictions, both in physics of uh, this uh, theory spaces, RG flows, and so on, but also in mathematics, proposing a generalization of TMF, which is extremely natural, but for some very strange, probably sociological reason, has not even been discussed in mathematical literature, apart perhaps one paper, but it's, it's, it didn't make much progress. So I'll start with physics, and um, you can think of these 2D theories as simplest possible quantum field theories. So this is nothing super esoteric. This is not some high dimensional physics. This is just simplest possible two dimensional physics you can imagine, the least possible supersymmetry. If you still prefer to think of something more sophisticated, think of these theories as theories on a world sheet of heterotic string, because zero one supersymmetry is all that heterotic string requires in two dimensions. And if you really love high dimensional stuff and string theory, again, think about this as a world sheet theory for heterotic string. The basic building blocks of two dimensional zero one theories are rather simple. They consist of uh, what you could call a chiral, but for some reason, and the literature is usually called scalar multiplet uh, in two dimensions. It consists of a real scalar phi and uh, right-moving Majorana while spinner psi plus uh, with the usual kinetic term for both, uh, which is basically d mu phi squared plus the Dirac operator of psi. There is a Fermi type multiplet which consists of this time left-moving Majorana while spinner psi minus. It has auxiliary field, which is also a real scalar capital F. It has also standard kinetic term. And uh, you can already start building interesting zero one theories from these basic building blocks by writing Landau Ginzburg type interactions. In zero two world, these are usually called J type interactions. These are super potentials, which are fermionic, namely, they uh, consist of taking a fermion multiplet and uh, arbitrary function of such scalar multiplets. So you can have this W of phi's and uh, multiplied by psi. This gives you uh, here expanded in components a uh, real version of super potential. Uh, which is a zero one supersymmetric interaction. And already here you can ask a lot of questions about all possible infrared physics of such zero one uh, Landau Ginzburg models. Uh, not so much is known about it, surprisingly. Or perhaps not surprisingly, because supersymmetry is pretty small. Uh, much of this uh, is summarized very nicely in a paper of Holland Witten from 85, which was not the first paper on uh, physics of such theories, but uh, among the first uh, applying it to string theory. And uh, you can find various more original references on various supermultiplets and so on in, in that paper. Um, the third type of multiplet that I want to introduce is a vector multiplet, so we'll consider in general two dimensional uh, theories which are built of matter, such as Fermi and, and this kind of scalar multiplets, uh, possibly charged under gauge groups, uh, which also have to come supersymmetrized. So therefore, apart from a gauge field, you have to have uh, left moving Majorana while uh, Gaugino lambda transforming in the joint representation of your gauge group. 
So with this usual building blocks, you have vector multiplets plus uh, two types of matter, namely the scalar and Fermi, and you can build lots of quiver type theories and ask natural questions. What are the infrared fixed points? What is the physics? And how do this, uh, this whole landscape of theories fits into uh, this framework, namely can I represent some classes in here by such theories? This approach uh, in this talk I'll call uh, bottom-up approach. Because basically I'm trying to start with basic building blocks with all the traditional rules of uh, 2D 0-1 heterotic-like uh, theories and um, answer the question how they um, tell us anything about this TMF classes. Do they support this conjecture? Do they rule it out? and uh, what else uh, that they tell us. So we won't go beyond two dimensions in the setting of, of this bottom-up perspective. Yes. It's very similar to Fermi multiplet. Exactly, exactly. Except that it transforms in a joint and so on. Any, any other questions? So these are basic building blocks of 2D01 theories, and um, you can already start playing with them and construct lots of Lagrangians, and the main question is, uh, what is the physics? So this turns out to be not such a simple question. I'll try to illustrate this for you in simple, concrete examples in, in this talk today, using the, this bottom-up perspective. But if you're building um, two-dimensional theories, it's important to make sure that gauge anomalies are canceled when we try to gauge some of the symmetries. And our matter was chiral. It contained in the Fermi multiplet the left-moving Majorana while spinner and the scalar multiplet right-moving uh, Majorana while spinner. So therefore, we have to make sure that there is a nice peaceful balance between those contributions. And here for you, I list um, gauge anomalies uh, contributing to um, G gauge multiplet, G, G vector multiplet um, for various uh, types of fields. So the vector multiplet itself, since it has chiral spectrum, has anomaly which is uh, proportional to uh, index. So the C2 should be um, interpreted as what's usually called index of a joint representation with a coefficient minus a half. And uh, for phi's and psi's and the representation r, it's also given by this quadratic index with coefficients either plus or minus. Um, and uh, here are the values for sun. Uh, this index for a joint is just n, and for fundamental would be one half. Yes, Martin, you have a question? No, of course not, yes. Yeah. So general theory will have, this is like Lego, and um, again, um, in our field, people love playing with this as Lego. They basically compose together a bunch of ingredients transforming in different representations. So this gives you a huge landscape to study. Namely, you can consider Landau-Ginsburg type models by interacting phi psi fields with J type superpotential. You can also gauge uh, things transforming in representations. So this is a pretty large landscape, which will be good enough for, for this bottom-up approach or, or will be basically the strategy of this bottom-up approach. Any question? Yeah. Um, in lower dimensions, uh, non-Lagrangian theories are rare. Non-Lagrangian usually appears, for example, in dimension two as, so W is W theories in some sense, close cousin of non-Lagrangian theory in high dimensions. So um, I'll be completely agnostic and uh, uh, studying this space of theories, the idea, of course, and that will be especially important in high dimensions, is to develop methods and tools, I should have already said it before, such that they'll handle both Lagrangian and non-Lagrangian theories equally well. So that was part of the reason, for example, introducing um, this uh, Morse-like index mu, uh, because unlike uh, anything that's related to or defined by Feynman diagrams, it can now be applied to non-Lagrangian theories as well. And we can study this without um, any hesitation in non-Lagrangian or Lagrangian setting. But in two dimensions, this won't be terribly crucial for us, but uh, I will come to, to such issues uh, quite soon, in fact. Because this bottom-up approach will have its limitations, as you're going to see in a second. 
So to illustrate this bottom-up approach, let's construct the simplest possible interacting super QCD in two dimensions, with 0, 1 supersymmetry, of course, because that's our general setting. So this I'll call, it's like an ising model of, of 2D 0, 1 theories, so I'll ask for simplest possible vector multiplet content, as long as it's not abelian, it deserves to be called super QCD. Of course, if it was abelian, that would be a bit boring, we would call it super QED. But super QCD would probably have to have at least SU2 gauge group, and let's assume that that's uh, minimal possible. Because of its own genus, it has contribution to gauge anomaly, which now we'll have to compensate by some matter. So we'll have to add sufficient matter to balance this off. And again, my approach will be to construct the simplest possible theory. So this will be like an Isaac model of 2D01 non-abelian gauge theories. So based on what I told you before, you can add uh, four real or equivalently two complex uh, Carrel multiplets, you can think of them as 0, 2, for 0, 2 supersymmetry, Carrel multiplets, transforming in the fundamental representation of this SU2 gauge group, and then anomalies will nicely cancel. So you'll have uh, minus 2, which is uh, supposed to be this number of colors uh, times 1 half, plus 4 of these guys times uh, 1 quarter, based on information from the previous slide, this allows you to cancel the anomaly. So the conclusion is that this uh, SU201 vector multiplet coupled to two, um, uh, zero 02 uh, fundamental chirals is the minimal 01 theory. But it was one half times one half. So thank you for catching this. So it's this half times this half. So thank you for checking, but I, I believe that's correct. So if everybody is convinced, then we have our Ising model of 2D01 super QCD. So question is, what is the physics? Where does it belong? Uh, what is the possible class to which theories it can be connected? Namely, what are the possible dualities or perhaps equivalences? Because that's another side, uh, flip side of this coin of talking about TMF. And um, you'll quickly see that this is a hard question because in this bottom-up approach, it's, uh, we have to come up with physics uh, just based on this information. So basically, given this, we're supposed to now solve for physics of this theory. I have no idea how to do it. And um, I would probably stop here in this, in this talk. Uh, if last year we didn't study analogous problem with Mikola Dedushenko, where we apply the same logic to 0, 2 theories. So, because in zero two theories, all anomalies are doubled, the same is actually true. You can take SU2 and four corresponding fundamental zero two chiral multiplets to cancel their anomalies. So this would be like Ising model in the zero two world, which we call zero two appetizer. And we showed that it's actually a dual. So here you have a little bit more uh, techniques um, to, and, and uh, tools to use. We conjecture that this is equivalent to Landau-Ginsburg model with uh, six chirals. H here there is no gauge group, it's just uh, Landau-Ginsburg model with six uh, chiral multiplets phi, now of zero two supersymmetry, single Fermi, and uh, super potential or this J-type interaction where you think of six as second antisymmetric of, of four and um, uh, write uh, this phi and for SU4 or SO6 uh, this gives you a particular polynomial interaction between uh, Fermi multiplet and, and this uh, uh, chiral multiplet phi. It, it's totally cubic, so this is a cubic interaction, and our claim is that in the infrared it flows to the same theory as this guy. So in whatever TMF or zero two theories, they would be in the same class, of course, if our conjecture is correct. Um, uh, it's, it's not quite mirror symmetry. I wouldn't say it's mirror symmetry. It's more analogous to cyborg type duality where you start with two theories and they flow to the same uh, fixed point. So for, for the sake of talking, so they would be not quite on the same leaf, but they would be definitely in the same equivalence class of uh, topology of, of our theory space of zero, in this case, zero two theories. Yeah. In that sense, in that sense, it's very similar. So in fact, that, that philosophy is used there too. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it. So first uh, part of the talk is, is physics, and then we'll, we'll switch to, to more math. So it says that there should be classes. So it, I mean, the conjecture was already uh, on the first slide, which says that um, in this uh, space of 2D01 theories, there should be many connected components. In fact, even if you fix this degree of the gravitational anomaly, the connected components uh, form a ring and um, you can, um, um, yeah, you, you have to match it. So. Yes, yes, yes. I, like I said before, several times you have three operations, plus, minus, and multiplication. I don't have time to talk about them in the talk, but they're in the paper, yeah. So I, I, these operations I'm not going to describe because that would be a talk on its own, actually. I'll be happy to do it, but perhaps privately you can ask me for, for physics of session operations. Huh? Uh, this is related to one of the TM4, yeah. It's, it's, it's one of the ingredients. But here it's just a standalone theory. So here we actually need zero one theory. And good news is that you can imagine a soft type breaking so we can use uh, the fact that our zero one theory is just half of this zero two theory to essentially try to kill half of the states by soft breaking on both sides and ask what happens. So what happens is that um, uh, this is uh, more work in progress. This is actually not in the paper with Kumaran and Pavel and, and uh, Du that I mentioned in the beginning, or that, that was on the first slide. So uh, here, we, th th this is known. This is uh, this appetizer duality. And by soft breaking on both sides and tracking what are the corresponding deformations, analogous tricks were used in bosonization fermionization a couple of years ago by Shamit and others, you can actually deduce what should be the 2D01 dual of this Ising model that we constructed by uh, canceling anomalies. So you actually conclude, th there are two possibilities, and I'll show you two possibilities. One is that you simply get a Landau-Ginsburg model of this type with real multiplets psi and phi. That's one option. But more likely is another option that you simply have phi free scalar multiplets of the zero one supersymmetry. So <clears throat> I'll try to give you an evidence for this, but this is not 100% and in particular we're still uh, working on it. But these are kind of questions you have to answer in order to know what's in the same class or not. So in, in uh, physical interpretation of this TMF, you have to understand really well equivalences and relations. So that's why I want to emphasize it's uh, very far from Math for math's sake, it's, uh, it, it, it's really uh, about physics of this thing. So um, let me give you an argument why this option is the one which is realized. Uh, first of all, in this theory, which we're trying to consider, namely SU2 with uh, two copies of zero two fundamental chiral multiplets, the classical moduli space is just basically a Higgs branch, so you take uh, scalars, there are a total of eight real scalars in them because there are two complex doublets. So if you multiply all of, the, all of this together, you get eight real scalars, uh, modded out by SU2. So classical moduli space that we're talking about is basically a cone on S7 mod SU2. So question is, what is this cone? <coughs> This is matter divided by gauge group, and in this context, we don't have D terms in, in zero one theory. So that's why we're just dividing by SU2. That's why it's not a Keller coefficient. So it's a five dimensional space, and, and uh, five dimensional space would certainly match five real scalars, but I have to show that that's the right space. So there are several ways you can act uh, with SU2 on C4 or equivalently on the base of the cone, which is a seven sphere. In fact, for completely different reasons, Waffe and Witten classified SU2 actions on uh, complex four-dimensional space when they consider topological twists of n equals four superangles. And in fact, the way they classified it is by uh, trying to ask how four, uh, in that case of SU2, or of SU4, transforms under what we can call SU2 color and SU2 flavor of our uh, super QCD. It has an F equals two, it has an C equals two. So we're asking the same question for a completely different reason. So there are actually three different ways SU2 can act on seven sphere. And of course, quotient is going to be some four dimensional space. And uh, 
it is this one that we need in the notations of Rafa and Witten for our present problem, and that's the one which actually gives just around four sphere. So other options would give something else with uh, other singularities. And now, of course, cone on a four sphere is R5. So that's justifying the claim that uh, already semi-classically, you get something like R5, and claim or conjecture is that nothing else happens in this uh, theory upon for the quantum corrections. So again, that's a kind of question that you face in this bottom-up approach. As you can see, I didn't get very far. I managed to predict first non-trivial non-abelian zero-one duality in two dimensions. As far as I know, there are no other candidates on the market, at least uh, as of yet. But I had to do quite a bit of work. And uh, if I didn't know zero-two appetizer, I'd probably be out of luck. Yes. Uh, you can, uh, in both cases, the number is five. It's, it's actually very easy. You compute gravitational anomaly in this uh, zero one super QCD, you get five, and five real scalars or this multiplets also give you five. So that's not a very precise information. More interesting would be information about the class to show that they're in the same class. So that's really why I did this exercise. Um, but here we learn something else. So it turns out that this usual TMF in degree five is actually trivial. But we don't have the usual TMF. The theories that we constructed actually have SU2 flavor symmetry. So already from this construction, even though it's a baby step, we already learned that we better construct not just classes of TMF, but classes of theories, not just with a fixed supersymmetry, but also with a global symmetry, such as SU2. And this is something that, again, in mathematical literature has not been developed, uh, what I'll call equivariant TMF. So in fact, in the paper, not only we provide a physical interpretation of the usual TMF, we develop technique or, or properties of what one might call equivariant version of it. So with a symmetry group G. So that doesn't exist so far. But using physics, we can predict what this classes should be. And the theory we just discussed is in fact of this type. It has flavor symmetry SU2, so it should leave in TMF of SU2. Any other questions? So now I'll tell you something a little bit. So I used bottom-up approach, trying to classify or ask what is the landscape of the zero-one theories. So now I'll try to ask how does it match what's already known about TMF. Again, we just made the first baby step, but my goal was to give you a flavor of how one studies this, this landscape. So now question is how do we match it to, um, um, to, to a known structure? So there are Three different facts about TMF that I'll try to explain in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. First fact is um, that there is a map. So if you don't know anything about TMF, this is your TMF 101, if you wish. So again, it's generalized cohomology here, which has three connections to something that you may know about. So first is that there is a connection between TMF and usual modular forms. So here, MF star is a graded ring of modular forms, which, as many of us know, generated, is generated by Eisenstein series E6 and E4. And um, in this version, you want to take the discriminant delta, the modular discriminant, and allow both uh, positive and negative powers of it. So then you get a ring, which is 24 periodic. In fact, periodicity is given by multiplication by this modular discriminant delta. and uh, it, there is a map from uh, this generalized cohomology of TMF of a point, or equivalently this uh, pi star of TMF, into the ring of modular forms, such uh, integral weakly holomorphic modular forms. This map is neither injective nor surjective. There is non-trivial kernel and co-kernel of this map. So in particular, uh, this ring is, has no torsion, no torsion classes, but TMF has a lot of torsion, and that's actually interesting. And uh, also not every modular form can be represented by image of the class in TMF. You should think of this modular forms in following discussion as elliptic genus of 2D01 theories. And uh, if conjecture or this physical interpretation is correct, it means that not any modular form of a given degree uh, in, in this context, this D is actually weight of modular form.
under this map, uh, this map one, this degree D is the weight of modular form, and <clears throat> not every modular form is actually represented by uh, elliptic genus of zero one theory. So again, that's a very strong statement, and uh, these are kind of statements that you have to battle in uh, this interpretation. But if you think about TMF itself, it's actually a curious fact, and the subject is that it's 24 square periodic. So it has periodicity of 576 rather than 24. So one interesting question is, what does it mean in physics? And uh, these are kind of questions you think. So second fact about TMF, so if you wish, modular forms give you some approximation to what this is. They capture everything other than torsion classes, uh, or a lot other than torsion. But the next map actually captures torsion. It's a map from stable homotopy groups of spheres into uh, this generalized cohomology theory into, into TMF. And uh, in low degree, when D is very small, it's actually very close to be isomorphism. So you can think of all classes of low enough degree, in fact, pretty much up to degree 18, uh, in positive direction and some number in negative direction as represented by the stable homotopy groups of spheres. So here is a couple of uh, classes and specific groups in low enough degree. In degree zero, TMF is basically generated by modular invariant J, this, this is a modular function, or I call it J, under the image of the first map. So the second uh, in, in group in, in degree one is actually Z2. It is generated over as a ring over uh, J uh, with additional generator, which is Z2 valued, and can be thought of as an uh, element of pi one of the stable homotopy groups of spheres. It's called a uh, Hopf invariant. It's also the same as Witten anomaly because this is basically the same as generator of pi four over three, uh, uh, over three sphere, which is SU2. So in the context of SU2 four-dimensional gauge theory, this would be called Witten anomaly. Uh, the degree two TMF is also Z2 of J. It's uh, generated by eta squared, where eta is this Hopf invariant. Uh, so this is not something terribly new, but it's interesting that it's torsion. So here you see Z2, Z2. And in degree three, you get something other than Z2. You start seeing multiples of two and three. As far as torsion is concerned, you get Z24 generated by yet another Hopf invariant, which is called nu. And this leaves in a uh, third degree of stable homotopy groups of spheres. So that's uh, the, this map. The second one is actually very close to be isomorphism. In fact, it is isomorphism on all of this and uh, up to other degrees. So you can ask an actual question, how do all of these classes, non-trivial classes in Z2, Z2, or Z24, are represented by different zero one theories? So that's uh, one of these questions that we answer in a paper. And um, to answer it, actually, it's helpful to use not, not, not this bottom-up approach, but a top-down approach. Namely, it's convenient to start with high-dimensional theories, such as six-dimensional zero-one theories, and there are many of them. In fact, unlike 6D02 theories, these are not just labeled by root systems. Uh, there is much bigger landscape of these guys. And you can compactify, a la Kautz and Klein, uh, the 6D01 theories on arbitrary four manifolds. The 6D01 theories have enough supersymmetry to be partially topologically twisted on any smooth four manifold. And here you can, can construct uh, analogs of what usually is called T of M4, uh, which you can quickly see have to be 2D01 theories. So this can be viewed as a machine that produces a bunch of two-dimensional zero-one theories from the data of initial six-dimensional zero-one theory and the choice of a four-manifold. And then you can also learn something about equivalences from Kirby moves and so on and so forth. So this top-down approach can generate lots of classes. And um, this is actually how you can indeed answer at least one of the questions, namely, are all of these TMF classes really populated? Namely, is this conjecture on the right track? by picking suitable 6D theories and uh, four manifolds. So let me show you how this goes in some simple example. Basic 6D01 theory is a free tensor multiplet. So there are many 
um, even Lagrangian theories in six dimensions constructed on of hyper, vector, and tensor multiplet. So if I take a tensor multiplet and reduce it on various four manifolds, um, I get different theories in two dimensions. In fact, it's easy to show by playing with anomalies that what I call degree here, this uh, C, C right minus C left multiplied by two is related to the Betty number of the four manifold in this particular case. So if I compactify, for example, this uh, 6D01 tensor multiplet on product of two spheres, I get something in degree one. That's gonna be our eta. In fact, it's a non-trivial class. If uh, we compactify it on CP2, we get something in degree three. That's gonna be this Hopf invariant nu, also non-trivial class, generator of Z24, which is quite non-trivial. And in fact, it's interesting that um, this physical interpretation of TMF suggests that uh, the degree D, first of all, uh, should not be just positive, which is usually assumed in mathematical literature from physics point of view. It's equally natural to consider both positive and negative values of the degree, which is uh, news for mathematicians who worked on TMF. And if you extend that, you get uh, populate various classes in negative degree as well. So uh, if you compactify it on Enrique surface or K3, you get various other classes. So this is uh, just a glimpse on top-down approach that can be very useful in constructing or understanding physics of the 6D01 theories and better be combined with this bottom-up bottom perspective. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, one generalization, so now I'm coming to, again, new results for new even for, for TMF community. Um, one generalization uh, of uh, the usual theory of topological modular forms is to the case where you have continuous symmetries. If a theory has global symmetry G, then you may ask analogous question, what is the space of such theories, modular deformations, very much what we asked in the very beginning, what is its topology and homotopy? If you set up uh, this question with fixed group G, you're trying to define what mathematicians might call equivariant version of TMF, and nothing is known about it, but based on physics, we can make predictions. And first, an already non-trivial prediction is, what is this TMF, equivariant TMF, graded by? What are the analogs of this label D? So they should not only depend on uh, gravitational anomaly, but some data that depends on the choice of the group in question. And our conjecture is that um, it's basically this label, analogous to D, is uh, set of values where all toothed anomalies of 2D01 theories take values in. So <clears throat> this D is nothing but gravitational anomaly, of course, and if you have a general 2D01 theory, um, you might expect that its, uh, its class should be graded or depend on the choice of, uh, you have to fix the, the, the value of uh, not just gravitational anomaly, but all possible toothed anomalies. And this set is given by this group, which involves uh, various spin cobordism groups of the classifying space of your symmetry G. So if G is uh, trivial, it boils down to the previous statement. This whole thing becomes just Z, where this D takes values in. But uh, this big group, um, based on, on classifying space, is supposed to be the answer for uh, general choice of uh, symmetry G. It's based on the philosophy that anomalies in two dimensions, or more generally in D dimensions, are related to symmetry-protected topological phases of matter in D plus one dimensions, where uh, classification was already done before in a series of papers, and this is the answer. So basically, we're borrowing that answer. We are pushing it through this relation or philosophy, which of course is, is not proven, and claim is that that should be the grading of this equivariant TMF. This relation in itself is, is very useful and has something to do with the third uh, perspective on, on TMF. Um, if you apply it to D equals one, uh, which corresponds basically to zero plus one dimensional quantum mechanics, it says that um, uh, set of such anomalies in uh, zero plus one dimensional quantum mechanics is uh, graded by Z8. And this Z8 is nothing but eight, periodi eight periodicity of KO theory. And this is actually related to yet another 
And the last map that I want to tell you about TMF, as, as uh, basically TMF 101, that there is a map from TMF to KO theory. And this map, um, so TMF is 576 periodic, KO theory is eight periodic, and this map can be viewed as a dimensional reduction from two-dimensional zero-one physics that we're talking about to uh, one-dimensional quantum mechanics with, um, if you wish, uh, one supersymmetry or time reversal. And in this case, it's known that uh, the uh, periodicity is, is Z8, and uh, it can be viewed as a mod 8 reduction of this gravitational anomaly, which labels the uh, 576 periodic um, values of uh, where, where this TMF classes. So <clears throat> this, um, this 8 periodicity is uh, quite interesting. It's related to um, work of Fitkovsky and Kitaev on SPT phases of fermionic systems in, in two dimensions, where uh, non-interacting systems are classified by Z, and interacting fermionic systems in one plus one dimensions are classified by Z8. So here, if we talk about this 1D quantum mechanics, then it's 2D uh, SPT fermionic phases. And a result of Fitkovsky and Kitaev is that um, they're, they're related by, classified by Z8. So I think uh, my time is up. I was going to say something about uh, various algebraic structures, but I think I should probably stop here, not to abuse that. <laughs> well, I can quickly uh, Flash through through this. Uh, so uh, yeah, so so the, 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 this this top down approach um, basically is is uh, has intersection with another line of work that we've been doing in this recent years, where we're trying to understand uh, topology of three manifolds and four manifolds via compactification. So this is this perspective where starting the six dimensional theory you can compactify it on either three manifold or four manifold to get what's known T of M3 or T of M4. So this has been successfully implemented in the world of uh, zero two series, um, where you get um, some vertex operator algebra from a four manifold, and, and uh, that encodes mathematical structure of T of M4, and if you apply it to three manifold, you get uh, modular tensor category and so on. So the new element to this list that I added today from, from that perspective of T of M3 or T of M4 is that in the world of zero one six dimensional theories, there is also a story and a role played by vertex algebra, this view A of M4 is now played by, by TMF class. Both have some modularity. In view A, of course, you have much richer modularity uh, built in, but uh, TMF is more about um, equivalence relations or classes, so it's more baroque, more, 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 more primitive. So, and uh, this is literally the last slide where um, I was planning to reinterpret topologically twisted indices in various dimensions, in diverse dimensions, in terms of corresponding mathematical structure. So uh, this is yet another subject of active research where people put various theories on circle cross a manifold and call this twisted topological index, so um, this, this sheds light on the structure of such twisted topological indices. But anyway, I don't have time. So. Thanks for asking, though. <laughs> They, they should, they should. So they, these are standard facts about TMF. Like I say, that's, uh, that's for usual TMF. So this one is the easiest to understand. Uh, and in fact, uh, we say quite a bit about this in the paper. There is, of course, an uh, equivalent version of KO theory that you can get from the corresponding Tom spectrum. And um, that's, uh, that, that's, that's actually a good guiding principle for what should be found inside TMF. For example, analogs of the Z2s that appear in low degree in TMF have analogs in equivariant version, and we make some predictions about it.
Well, you, you, you basically can use it as a definition that, that indeed equivariant TMF is equivalence classes, blah, 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 just repeat everything verbatim, but question is what is it? So uh, you have to give it, I mean, this, this are, like I showed in low degree, concrete groups. So our goal was to actually make a prediction for what are these concrete groups in low enough degree in equivariant version. And we don't know the answer for all value of all possible Gs, but uh, we made a prediction for U1 and SU2. So it would be interesting to extend it even further. But yeah, there should be analogs of these maps. Yeah, uh, uh, like you say, it's, 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 it's a completely different new version. I do want to give them a lot of credit because they were our inspiration and uh, source of uh, painful headache when, when we're trying to understand what, what they really mean. But there are some crucial differences. So one difference, for instance, which I mentioned briefly, is that um, D, uh, this degree, is not limited to positive range which uh, in math literature is always the case. So one already obvious prediction from physics, and I'm quite sure that this is correct, is that D can be positive and negative. So that's, that's one simple important statement. And then there are various other bells and whistles, such as equivariance and so on. Uh, but in, in the paper, you can find lots of similarities and distinctions to, to Stoll's technique. Like, like I said, uh, the, the, this also could be wrong. I, it was, <laughs> there is a lot to prove to actually uh, justify this physical interpretation. Lots of equivalences and, and lots of facts about 2D theories. For instance, if somebody finds a theory, 2D theory, which has C left minus C right, which is not half integer, it immediately rules out both their version and our version, and something else should be true. 